It's been a year since we've had the chance to host an in-person event, um, an extension, and I'm really thrilled to see a lot of folks that um, really aren't our traditional extension event attendees. Um, so I'm hoping you get the chance to know a little bit more about what we do and a little bit more about why we're here today. Um, I'm gonna have the chance here shortly to um, share a little bit more about extension, um, but like I said, the purpose of why we're here today is to talk about agriculture, to talk about what our outlook is in the local area. Um, for those over there, I'm going to tilt the screen just a little bit. Purdue Extension has four pillars. Um, so we're here today to focus on agriculture and natural resources. Um, as expected, you're in a 4-H building right now. So we have a strong 4-H program here in Dearborn County. We have a strong 4-H program in Indiana. Um, we've got our Farm Bureau president back there trying to help us out with the uh, hand dryers. They're a little loud in the background. Um, we also have two other programs I want to make sure that you're aware of. One is community development. That's actually 20% of my role in, in Dearborn County. What does community development mean? Community development means we work with businesses, local leaders, and others to provide programs. We work on programs such as property tax education. Um, we're also working on a local government um, retention program, business retention program. So you hear more about that. And then lastly, we also have a health and human science program, maybe more traditionally known to you as home economics or family consumer sciences. And I'm proud that in Dearborn County, we have three different educators who are traditionally known as agents working in all four of these different program areas. So as I said, I see a lot of faces I haven't seen at extension events before, and I have not yet introduced myself. I am, thank you, Russell. <laughs> I am John Hawley, your county ag and natural resource educator. I'm also your county community development educator. But that's enough about extension. I want to talk about all my great partners in the back, including the gentleman that just helped me turn off the loud fans because we are, like I said, recording this meeting. Um, so we're here today to talk. Oh, goodness, I skipped the slide. I was going to pause my clicker today. I want to make sure I recognize all my partners that have helped uh, for this event. Some of them are going to be speakers here later today. Um, I want to recognize Matt Jarvis with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Thank you, Matt. He'll be talking here in a second. That really neat logo of Indiana, that is our county and state soil and water conservation district logo. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about what they do today. We've also got our watershed director, Heather Worth, over there. She represents both the Whitewater River and Hogan Creek watershed. You're going to hear a little bit about what she does. We've also got our Farm Bureau president, Russell Byersdorfer, um, and also some of our other Farm Bureau leaders, including Jan Olmansing, um, as well as Brad Ponzer, who is one of our regional Farm Bureau managers. Perfect. I got your title right. And then lastly, thank you, Vicki. Chuck Deputy with the uh, USDA Farm Service Agency, the great partner of mine. Many of you probably know Chuck. He couldn't make it today, but he uh, is uh, got someone speaking for him here briefly. All right, enough about introductions and everything. I want to make sure we focus on why we're here today. And this is an event I've wanted to do for a few years for several different reasons. Um, I wanted to make sure that our local stakeholders, not just the traditional farming crowd we have in the room, I'm, I'm proud to be looking at several different farmers, people that grew up on farms, our keynote speaker, Sarah Jordan is a farm girl herself, I think I'm using a, an, an okay phrase there, but I've also got other people in the business community here, I've got local leaders, former school superintendents in the room, that I think are, are great um, you know, voice boxes for agriculture, the great uh, proponents for agriculture, not, not to advocate for one form of production or for one part of ag or another, but to just simply educate the public. And so we've also got some local elected officials watching today, um, and I'm really proud that uh, we've been able to reach out to them and that they've been big supporters of our office. So we're here today because when you think about Dearborn County, you may not think about corn and soybean and cattle and livestock. Um, you may think of us as a bedroom community for Cincinnati, and that's very much true. Um, and our real estate uh, speaker today, she'll probably focus a little bit on that. We've got a lot of urban sprawl, people moving out from Hamilton County into more suburban and urbanized areas. But when you look at how Dearborn County grew, when you look at how Dearborn County uh, still functions, there's a lot of social and economic and environmental factors that play a role and they're directly tied to agriculture. So what is the state of our ag economy today? Um, obviously, we're all wearing masks in the room, and I'm not going to try to focus too much on COVID today, but I would be neglectful if I didn't bring up the impacts that COVID has made in our ag economy, because it's impacted every other sector of our economy in the first place. Um, so when we look at, at, at beyond just COVID and other impacts in agriculture, 
the perceptions vary. If you talk to someone in Pennsylvania, maybe you talk to someone in Florida or God forbid my home state of Texas where they're dealing with a catastrophe right now, you're gonna get different feedback on different sectors of agriculture. How the corn and grain market's performing isn't exactly identical to how the fruit and livestock market's performing. It's a little different depending on who you talk to. But when we focus on Dearborn County, despite the setbacks and the changing times that we've dealt with, things are looking pretty good. And I'm really proud to say that. I'm proud to say that we've got a lot of things to be proud of. And, and I'm not a farmer myself. I'm speaking for the farmers in the room and I'm hopefully giving them the chance to recognize what they've accomplished despite some really, really troubling circumstances. So I wanna make sure that I, I talk about this picture here. Um, that is George Street in downtown Aurora. And I see some of you shaking your heads. That is a good sign for the farmer because grain prices are about as good as they've been in five plus years beyond that. So if you've been down to Aurora, you've taken George Street to get into town, you've probably been stuck behind a few of those trucks. And I don't know about you, but I'm usually okay with that. Because that usually means the farmer is doing well. Now the inverse of that is, yes, we might see some food and commodity prices going up here shortly, but we're gonna talk about agriculture and that is a sign that grain prices are about as good as they've been in a long time. Now, I do wanna make sure that we talk about some numbers. But full disclaimer for those watching online and for the people that are listening here today, I'm an agricultural scientist and an educator. I am not an economist. So don't throw any numbers at me or any theories or anything like that because it's my partners and the people I work with on campus at Purdue that put these great reports together. I'm simply doing my job by disseminating it and sharing it with the public here today. So when we look at Dearborn County, we're really, um, in a lot of ways, fairly average, but in a lot of ways, we're, we're either lower or higher in different categories. So our average farm size, this is from the most recent um, USDA Agricultural Statistics Report. They send one to our office uh, every year, um, and you can order one as well from the USDA directly. Our average farm size, 108 acres. Out of 92 Indiana counties, that is the 87th smallest on average. That's not a bad thing. When you look at our topography, how the land has been sold, how it was shared, how it was passed down, it makes sense. When you look at a lot of our farms, they're, they're very small and diversified. And going into that number, we're right at about 600 farms. Now, these things change. And yes, farms do close, new farms open. So we're look, you know, looking at about 600 farms. We're right in the middle, actually, on the higher end of, of all 92 Indiana counties. What does that tell you right there? We have a lot of small farms. When we look at um, other factors, this is what I wanted to make sure we share today. Indiana is very, very uh, covered in woodlands. We're, we're 20th in total acres of woodland in this state. It's kind of astounding to think, but when you think about um, our land and how we're laid out and everything, um, it does make sense. You're talking 17,000 roughly acres of woodland, ranking 20 out of 92 counties. And then here's where our big money maker in agriculture is. And this is my, not my opinion, but really what the numbers tell us. We rank eighth out of 92 counties in Indiana when it comes to pasture land. That's all types, all types of pasture land, not just for cattle or goats, different types of pasture land. Now, when we talk about traditional ag, we're focusing on cropland. That's where, once again, I said, we're up and down a lot of categories. There are only about seven counties with less cropland than Dearborn County. So we're near the bottom at about 30,000 acres. Like I said, I knew my clicker probably wouldn't work today. Some other important census data, and I'm trust me, this is not the whole presentation today, so if you're like me and numbers kind of make you cringe a little bit, this is about the end of my numbers. Um, total farm income, we're talking about $16 million uh, at the latest report, the 2019-2020 report, 87. So lower overall, not necessarily a bad thing when you see the number of farms and everything else factored in. When you look at our traditional crops and everything we talk about in Indiana, where does it start? Corn and soybean. Whether that's good or bad, that's your own opinion, but everything when it comes to the value of cropland, when it comes to the overall value of land, a lot of that thinking with Indiana ag economists start with corn and soybean production. So the amount of corn harvested uh, in this uh, most recent year, this actually would have been 2019, was uh, 51,000 or 5,100 acres. When we look at soybeans, we're looking at about 9,900 acres. Um, and when you look at those yields, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about yields compared to the rest of the state, but just know this, we're toward the bottom and that's okay um and we'll explain a little bit of that later um we not as quite not quite as big a factor 500 acres um but that's 52nd out of 92 indiana county so not insignificant at all when you talk about total production
A few more. So looking at livestock and some more diversified agriculture. So cattle. Makes sense. We've got all that pasture land, right? So we have 6,000 head of cattle ranking right dead smack in the middle of Indiana at 46 out of 92 counties. When you break that down a little farther and look specifically at beef cattle numbers, we've got 2,600 head at the most recent report. So 19, 19 out of, 80, uh, out of 92 Indiana counties. It's a pretty significant rank, I'd say. Um, milking cows, obviously we could talk long, and I, lo I love hearing from a lot of you that have grown up around here about the, the historical impacts of the dairy industry in this area. Obviously we know it isn't what it once was, but we still do have 300 head of, of milking cows, putting us right in the middle. Um, a lot of interest in sheep, small, small sheep herds, a lot of people, you know, 4-H animals, things like that. So 400 roughly total head of sheep, and then chickens, uh, about a thousand. Once again, we look at most of these numbers aside from the beef cattle, which is separate from cattle total, we're right in the middle, which makes sense when you consider um, a lot of our historical production methods. So what I want to point out too is when you see a lot of this and, and you see those counties that are just blown out of the water, tens of thousands of head, it's usually because they have confined feeding operations. We do not have any confined feeding operations in this county, if you didn't already know that. So I swore no more numbers. So don't let this chart scare you. I'm not going to go through this point by point by point because you'd all probably just walk out and leave and everyone would sign off online. But I do want to talk about um, our Purdue Agricultural Economics Report. This is something sent out um, every year by the experts at Purdue, and uh, it's based off of a survey that goes out toward the middle of the year. Um, what this survey tells us in a lot of ways, it's, it's an analysis of landowners and other key stakeholders. It, it tells us where we stand as far as agricultural production, once again, based off of corn. And it also tells us where our land values are going, where our projected land values are expected to be. So once again, we're not going to go through this chart, but we are going to focus on the southeast sector because this, this report sent every year breaks Indiana into about uh, six different categories, north, northeast, west, central, central, southwest, Southeast. Now, a key disclaimer as we break apart these Southeast Indiana numbers, like compared to some of our neighbors, or uh, excuse me, compared to some of our neighbors, the Decatur counties of the world, the Ripley counties, we're little brother when it comes to some of these production numbers because we just don't have that tillable land that some of the other counties do. Um, at least not in the numbers. Doesn't make the, the the smaller numbers we have insignificant. But when you look at the averages and you look at the production coming out of our county, um, it, it's a little it's a little bit on the lower end. So when you look at average yields for corn um, in, in the Southeast Indiana area, you're looking at top performing ground giving you about 188 bushel an acre. I know a lot of farmers in this area that would kill for that. When you're looking at average performing land in the Southeast Indiana area, you're looking at about 162 bushels an acre. And then when you look at poor performing land, about 130 bushels. Not insignificant compared to what your inputs are and every, every other factor that must be considered. Um, when you look at the actual, you know, dollars per acre, the, you know, the land value that's, that's uh, put right here in this report, you're looking at um, June of 2019, so we're talking almost two years ago now, an average land value somewhere about 4000 between the average and poor performing land. That's kind of what we're seeing as far as tillable land, Dearborn County. Um, and a lot of that, like I said, going once again based off of corn. Where is this going? Today's an outlook. We're not just talking about the numbers. We're talking about what we're to be expected to be in the future. Well, when you look at the outlook, the change, it, it varies a little bit. Um, from roughly um, June of last year to June, or excuse me, June of 2019 to June of last year, we saw a big spike, a big jump. Maybe not insignificant, but due to COVID, when they reassessed everything and looked from, um, you know, 29, um, the end of 2019 to the middle of 2020, which would have been the first part of the COVID-19 pandemic, land values dropped three and a half percent. Um, so further breaking down these numbers, where they're expected to go, um, when you look at land value actually per bushel, so actually per bushel of corn produced, um, we're looking at about in 2019, about $30. Um, it went down a little bit in 2020. Um, and then where is that projected actual land value? Now, I'm sharing the numbers from the June report. There is a December report. I'm sharing the June report because it's more comprehensive. So you can go if you'd like to do more research, because like I said, I'm not going to give you numbers all day, I promise. But um, what I can tell you is, is based on their projections for December 2020, with an average projected land value in our area of about 3,600 for poor land, 4,800 for um, average land, it stayed about that. Now, this is why I invited Sarah today with Lux Realty. 
when you look at our actual developing lands, and I, I have the pleasure and, and the honor, I should say, of serving on our county plan commission. Um, I'm not sure if others in the audience might call that an honor. But when you look at two different factors, two different median values of our land values in the area, we're not going just on agriculture and tillable land. We're talking about potentially developed land. So when you look at Southeast Indiana, a five acre or less home site in 2017 brought you 10 grand. This is all based on, on good economic survey data. It stayed the same roughly um, from, from 2017 to 2020. Now I'm just sharing these numbers. I invited Sarah here today because she may be able to provide us some more inferences into why you see this sort of value. Now that's a five acre or less for a home site. And we get a lot of those. We get a lot of those. We get a lot of those that really don't work for my two members in the audience that are on plan commission for a variety of factors. Now, when we look at larger tracks for subdivisions, that's where we start to see the reduced value of land in Southeast Indiana, as unfortunate as that is. So compared to the rest of the state in 2017, a 10 acre or, or um, over the average price per acre for a subdivision was $8,000. Where is that at today? $8,000. Compared to the rest of the state, that's the lowest figure in every other region, compared to every other region. So that tells you that our land value as far as development isn't quite as enticing. There's a lot of factors for that, and uh, we'll probably go into that just a little bit. As always, when I go through numbers, I've got to stop. I've got to breathe a little bit. So one really easily digestible economic factor that goes right into our agricultural outlook, that goes right into the health of our ag economy, it's a really neat tool called the Ag Economy Barometer. Now, Purdue and uh, uh, excuse me, Purdue University in partnership with CME Group, which is a uh, economics group, um, developed this tool about five or six years ago, I think starting in 2016. Um, this tool takes numbers for people like me and simplifies it to tell, um, the, you know, like I said, the basic folk what farmers are thinking, what they're feeling, what they're perceiving about the economy. Um, so this is a measure of the health of the U.S. agricultural economy. Um, this index as we're going to call it, is based off of a monthly survey sent to 400 different agricultural producers. Not just corn, not just soybean, not just wheat. They expand to all different markets. And you can see the neat little logo there. They got cattle, they got corn, they got bean, hogs, and they go even beyond that. So here's the kind of charts that I like to see. It's, it's pretty simple. This, and I want to make sure I use my pointer here, this economy barometer report is right now. This is the most recent report. They send one out, like I said, every single month. And these charts tell us really more than any other chart that you can find what farmers are thinking. And we're going to break this down in a couple different sections because, like I said, I'm going to try not to talk too much about COVID today, but I will touch on it. So when you look at the economy barometer today, we are at a rating out of 200 of 165. At the end of 2020, we were at a record high, 183 out of a score of 200. Would you think that we feel that way? Maybe in December, not really. Maybe right now, yeah, that, that 163 out of 200 or 165 out of 200 kind of makes some sense. We'll break that down a little further here in just a minute, but that's our current score. In addition, instead of just giving us an index that, yeah, it simplifies it, but doesn't tell us much, there is some more that can tell us more. Um, so when we look at how farmers are actually feeling, are they, are they better off or are they worse off? Um, so right now, Roughly, so you look at green on this chart here, for those watching, you should be able to see that. And for your, um, if you're looking at your sheet there, um, the, uh, the green line here is showing us the perception of farmers feeling that they're better off than they were a year ago. So a year ago is when the bottom fell out. A year ago is when everything started shutting down, locking down, and things obviously got a little tense. So right now, roughly about 33% of farmers feel that they're better off today than they were a year ago. That's not bad, right? Um, worse off, you can see it's taken a nosedive. It skyrocketed right here about last spring, early last summer. I, I wonder why. And it's continually taken a nosedive as the ag economy has not only recovered from COVID-19, but it's made a roaring recovery. All right, I promised you I wasn't gonna dig into numbers all day. So I just wanna talk for a minute about some really cool things going on in local agriculture, and I've had the pleasure to be involved with a lot of these different uh, positive local trends, as I'll call them. The first one is our farmer's market growth, and I do see a few people here that are involved with the farmer's market. Um, we have three really strong markets in Dearborn County right now. 
We have a great market in Lawrenceburg, we've got a market in Bright, and we've got a really great market in Hillsboro. They all offer different things and they all offer different benefits to our local producers. But the one thing I can tell you, and I've been in this position for about four years now, is there's renewed interest every year. More and more people want to walk, they want to know what's going on, they want to walk to the market, they want to go visit, they want to buy produce, they want to see more different kinds of produce. And so I'm really proud to say that those three markets are strong and there may be new markets to come. Um, obviously, you look decades back, there were other markets, obviously, when the, when the economy functioned a little differently. But when it comes to farmers market growth, I'm really proud to say that our three markets are doing well. And as always, um, you drive through Dearborn County or any rural part or even suburban part of Indiana um, in the summer, early summer, late spring, you're going to see roadside stands. Um, and the neat thing about that is it's a little easier for the farmer to sell. It's a little less regulation um, as far as, you know, when someone comes on your farm, the onus is on them. You know, whereas the, the thought, if I talk to farmers about shipping anything, whether it's watermelons, potatoes, whatever, the thought gives them a headache. You know, yeah, I'll take it to the farmer's market, that's easy, but shipping it somewhere or sending it somewhere, that's stressful. Selling at a roadside stand, if you have the capacity, is fairly simple. And yes, I'm going to talk about hemp just a little bit here shortly, and that is a picture of a hemp field in Dearborn County from last year. So uh, for, for those that haven't had a chance to see, uh, we've tried to share a lot of this information in the past, but Dearborn County has had the, um, and our office specifically, has had the pleasure of working with three different farmers on hemp production. Um, now most of this is focused on production for non-cannabinoid CBD oils. So no, it's not the smokable stuff. Don't, don't get crazy about, you know, <laughs> we, we, we do have some of those people that think, wait, you're growing marijuana? No, the industrial hemp that was grown in Dearborn County last year, that will be grown in Dearborn County again this year, is for different purposes, primarily CBD oil. Um, so this is actually a farm off of Church Road in Lawrenceburg, and I know a lot of you know where that is. We've actually got a farmer in the room who's got a, a cattle farm right, right past that road. And um, what I can tell you is they had an up and down year, but it was a really neat experience. I had the chance to work with those farmers on looking at agronomic problems, bugs, pests, disease, um, and there's a lot of challenges. We haven't grown this crop in Indiana for a long, long time. But I was really proud to say that they put a lot of good money into it. They put a lot of sweat, blood, and tears. And I think we're going to have a few farmers every year jump into the market and hopefully take advantage of something that in 10 years, when we look down the road, is sustainable and offers something for farmers to jump into. Probably don't need to explain this, but we've got a pretty strong livestock market around here. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I will admit it, I grew up in Texas, so full disclaimer. Um, I hadn't heard the term freezer beef where I grew up. I don't know why. We just kind of just called it, you know, oh, let's just go buy a cow. Let's just go buy a half. You know, let's go buy a quarter. Um, out here, freezer beef is the term, and freezer beef is a strong market. And like I said, I've got, I'm looking at a cattleman right here in the back who sells a lot of freezer beef. And I've worked with a lot of those people, and I've bought directly from those people. And what I can tell you is there's more and more and more interest in that. And we'll talk about how really there's kind of a, a bottleneck on more processing. We're going to talk about processing here in a minute. But um, the interest isn't going away. So I'm really proud to say that. That's a really strong local trend. Agritourism. I'm looking at a few farmers in the room that offer agritourism experiences. Um, and, and really skipping down, you know, right below, you pick operations falls right into that category. Agritourism is, is the um, tourism of, of, of farms, for those that haven't heard the term. Essentially, you go visit a farm and it brings you back to that, you know, green acres, you know, you know, nostalgia. People come and they drive 30 minutes out of, out of Hamilton County and they pull up to a farm and they see the chickens, they see the cows, and it may be their kid's first time seeing those things, at least in person. They get to feed the pig, they get to toss food to the chickens. And uh, there's a lot of interest in that because we are that bedroom community that's not in the city, that's not urbanized per se, but can offer that rural experience rather closely. And like I said, you pick operations, that falls right into it. So we've got a you pick operator in the back that offers berries. Um, you know, you walk up and pick his berries during the summer when they're in season. And you know, you pick the berries you want, you put them in a little basket, he weighs you out, you pay, and you've been out of the farm for a day. And it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. And last year he had a pretty good year compared to the year before. And um, you know, the other you pick operators I've heard from, as well as the people in the farmer's markets, they, they reported record year last year during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think the reason why and this has kind of been my joke the last year as well, can't go to the bar, couldn't go to the movies, couldn't go to the ball game, I'm going to go to the farmer's market. And that was essential. You got to have food, right? And we know, I know a lot of people that buy the majority of their food from farmer's market, especially during the summer. You know, I can't tell you how much bussy sweet corn I ate last year. 
you know, and I, I bought it for other places too. So the farmer's market growth was really strong. It was really connected um, in a lot of ways to people wanting to get out of their house last summer when things warmed up. You may not think of community gardens as an agricultural topic, but it is. And it's what uh, Purdue Extension, a lot of other systems and scientists like to call urban agriculture. And so if you've been um, right next to Beecher Presbyterian Church in downtown Lawrenceburg, you've seen a really, really successful community garden. Um, and I've been proud to partner with them on a few different things. Uh, Shira Tedesco is kind of the leader with that, as well as Pastor Bob Northcutt. And the community garden growth in, the, in, in Dearborn County is, is continuing to rise. There's a really nice community garden off of uh, State Line Road, if you've driven up that way and, and seen that garden on the left side of the road. Um, Aurora recently approached us about potentially working on one. There's been one in Aurora before. And so we're going to see a lot of interest in that community garden where, where essentially how these work, if you haven't heard of that, is folks work together, they share a plot or they get their own plot, they grow their own food, they pick it, share it with the community, and it's a great social experience. And once again, in a year like we had last year, it was something that was a benefit that in a lot of ways was considered essential as well. Okay, I promise I'm going to focus as positively as I can on, on, on the good and, and the recovery from COVID-19, not on the bad. Um, but the initially, the COVID-19 outbreak was, was really scary for agriculture um, and for a lot of different reasons. And without talking too much, I think a picture explains it. So I, I know we've got some in the back. Essentially what this is, is showing how your farm products get to the table. And so those little roads, that bottleneck, that one little box right there, that's a processing facility. And so what happened last spring when COVID hit, and we didn't really know how it was spreading yet. We didn't know how contagious it was. It broke out in a few different processing facilities and they closed. And so what happened is all that stuff from the farm, the hogs, the cattle, the other animals, especially livestock, there were other product problems too. Don't get me wrong. There were people that called me that, um, you know, they, they were trying to find produce at the grocery store and they couldn't. They were trying to find this product, you know, obviously we know what happens in a pandemic. We're Americans. Bread and milk, gone. <laughs> Maybe you haven't had milk in years, but man, when something bad happens, whether it's weather or something, I got to go buy milk. Got to go buy bread. Same thing happened here. <laughs> Same thing happened here, um, except it, it caused some really, really widespread problems for farmers. Um, once those processing plants closed, the supply ran low, and the producers that were stranded, they, they, they went to a lot of different avenues, unfortunately. Many of them cut feed. Some of them ceased breeding operations. And yes, I, I have to say this, in, in some extreme scenarios, we did have euthanasia, and we did have people... Um, having to dump milk. And so thankfully there were a lot of different programs in response to this that fought this off and it didn't last very long, but there was a period there in about May of last year that was really, really tough for our local farmers. Um, and that's where, I'm going back to the Ag Economy Barometer right now, that's where that sentiment just bottomed out. I got a little arrow here. That's what happened early last summer, late last spring. Now, you see we were riding pretty high there at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And so, you know, the higher the market was, the bigger the fall, but that fall was big and it was big there for a long time. Um, I don't think we'll ever see quite a swing like that on this chart again, anytime soon. But that shows you, we went from a score of 168 to 96. And like I said, this, this tool, as simple as it is, it's quite a bit newer, but it really shows us the impact of what happened. So like I said, processing was the problem and locally, it was already a problem. I had talked to so many farmers, I still talk to farmers that they're, they're booking, you know, processing out months and months and even years in advance because they, they can't find a place to send their animals. And I'm looking at one, I keep forgetting, I've got another one back here too that's had the same problem where, you know, I'm, I'm booked so far out and, and I, I'd like to sell you some, but I'm sold out and, and trust me, the last thing a farmer wants to do is not be able to sell you something. And so processing has been a problem for a while, and COVID just exacerbated that. Um, but what good it did is it did reignite some discussions for opening new processing facilities, finding new funding from the USDA and other sources to expand existing facilities. And so um, I'm really proud to say that, that Purdue and, and many other extension systems, our other partners, business coalitions, and others have, have worked to open this up, have worked to reignite the discussion and see what can't be done to offer more processing is if it was already a problem and COVID made it worse, you know, it, it really opened our eyes. So really, 
in the future expect to see continued interest um, in the expansion and the development of new livestock processing facilities. All right, I found a really neat, um, no background picture of corn I wanted to show off today. I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to the end of my presentation here. But I was asked, and I think Matt's still in the room, Matt asked me to share one unique agricultural tidbit today, and it's the flavor of the month, I can tell you right now. And that is the Brood X Cicada Emergence that is coming soon. This is, I had the chance to talk with Bubba Bo yesterday at Eagle 99.3. This is like topic number one in anything outdoor. People, some are, are panicking like locusts in the biblical times and everything's going to fall from the sky. And, and what Bubba asked me yesterday, uh, he said, how old were you the last time it happened? I said, well, I was 10, but I also wasn't living here. So I've never been able to go through this. And I'm one of those weirdos that's super excited about it. <laughs> um, I've even had the chance to talk to someone that said they were excited because they have a pet frog. A pet frog that the last time this happened, and I don't think it's the same frog, but they, they, they took the frog on a drive with, with, with the cover down in the car and let the cicadas fall into the car. And he, he, I don't know why, but that, that was, for him, it was like, I just can't wait. I've got, I've got this pet frog. You're going to find all sorts of different perspectives. My wife, she probably won't come out of the house. You know, um, my dog, she'll probably eat 40 of them. So let's actually talk about what these things are. So we have annual cicadas every year. You hear them at night. They're, they're a, an important part of, of the ecosystem, important part of the food chain. These 17 year cicadas are, are a little different. It's, a, it's the largest brood we have out there that, it, that impacts our area. Um, and it's gonna start in late April, um, roughly going most of May and, and even parts of June. Roughly what, what, what the research tells us is once that soil hits about 64 degrees, that's when we're gonna start seeing these guys. So keep an eye on that and you're gonna start, I think a lot of the meteorologists and the weathermen and the weather women, I, I think they're gonna cover this pretty extensively because it's, you, know, you, you, you are going to have those shots where part of the sky is blacked out for a second or something, and it's going to make for good TV. Um, so why do we talk about them, though? They're just a bug, right? You know, you already deal with the, the, the stink bugs in your house, the love bugs, and everything else that flies in around and bugs us. Um, you get a lot of those little, those little Asian lady beetles. We deal with those like crazy. But why are these such a big deal? Well, they can cause some, in some cases, some severe agricultural impacts, primarily it, it, for, for fruit producers. Um, on the younger trees, essentially. And our next speaker is actually a fruit producer, so I'll let him talk more if he'd like to. But essentially, the females have this sharp little tool. They lay their eggs. And it cuts into the branches. They lay their eggs, and that's what hurts the tree, primarily the young trees. So you'll see what's called flagging in the trees, and you'll see, like, these little dead branches hanging in spots of the tree. And in severe cases, it, it can really wipe some things out. They're definitely going to be in our area, but, but the other primary locations, you're talking central parts of the Ohio River Valley, Pennsylvania, Western Carolinas, even parts of Georgia, most of the of the eastern, um, not seaboard per se, but most of the eastern United States, there's spotty impacts um, from, from these uh, lovely bugs. So um, as always, the Extension Office is happy to answer your questions when it comes to cicadas. We've got a really neat two-page report from our campus specialist I'd be happy to share for you. Um, and I know I've, I've been asked to give a presentation at the library in June, so that'll be a fun, fun thing. That's like a bunch of little boys and girls playing with bugs. So, um, the last part that I'm going to share here today, um, as far as a unique agricultural tidbit, is our county and state fairs. So obviously last year with everything else being canceled um, or postponed or converted to virtual, our county fair was no exception. I'm really proud of my partners in my office, particularly our, our office director, Liz Byersdorfer, who is our 4-H educator as well. She worked really hard with our fair board, and there's some fair board members in the room, and others, the 4-H board and other leaders, to, to make some neat things happen for the kids. I'm really proud to say we are going to have an in-person fair this year. It's not going to look the same. I can't tell you all that, and I'll let Liz answer those questions and our fair board president answer those questions if he'd like to. But why I bring up the fair as a unique agricultural tidbit is it's our premier ag event. Yes, the kids are the ones showing the livestock, not the adult producers, but a lot of those livestock that get shown, they're sold from those producers in Dearborn County in our area, in our, in our greater area. And it shows a lot of those unique champion breeding aspects and, and how, you know, how the market looks. And, and for those who are a little bit older in the room, you know, you, you remember going to County Fair in the 60s or 70s, how different the animals were raised, how different the animals look these days, how much leaner a cut of beef is and things like that. And that's why the fair is neat. Uh, we also have a flower show. Our, our Master Gardener program puts on a flower show. There's a lot of neat, unique agricultural aspects to the fair. 
It happens every June. So I encourage you all to attend to support the 4-Hers, but also the local vendors and other people. There's all sorts of fun stuff going on. Um, and the state fair, that did happen in person, but it was just for the 4-H aspect. Proud to be involved with that last year. There were a lot of kids up there and proud to say that it wasn't any sort of COVID outbreak. It was done safely um, and it will be done safely again this year. Um, so I'm just super, super happy to share that. With that, that is my part of the presentation. Um, just a couple minutes for questions if anyone has any. Yeah, Mel? John, about six slides back, you had the barometer on there. It was in the pool where it had the big dip. Okay. Right there. And so if you go back to 2016, just to give us some perspective, what was the big jump? Any idea what could have been a big jump there in that 2016-2017 time period that would induce something like that again to get the big jump in that in, in the ground? Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that, so uh, for those that are listening online, um, I'm, I'm not going to infer too much because that's not my job, but this big jump in late 2016 is likely directly tied to an election. So I won't say anything else. That actually took me a minute to remember, and then uh, our, our next speaker did uh, mention that for me. So for those online, the question was, why did we see such a big jump in 2016? And like I said, that was likely tied to an election. Any other questions? <laughs> 